My name is Geneva Hall, and I am proud of myself because I have drive and ambition, and I know what I want, and the most important thing that I need now are the tools to get what I want. My name is Elaine Spencer, and I'm proud of myself because I have the determination and ambition to reach for higher goals. My name is Mary Billington, and I'm proud of myself because after 13 years, I came back to school, and it took a lot of courage to quit a job, being the mother of two children and the head of a household. My name is Rachel Crudy. I am proud of myself for the independence that I am gaining for myself and my five children. I'm proud of coming here to study so that we will not only have financial security, but a better way of life. My name is Jessie Mae Ford, and I'm proud of myself because I'm taking this opportunity to better the condition in life for my children and myself. Downtown New Orleans, a city like many other American cities, confronted with the problems of growth, change, decay. Challenge to rethink, replace, rebuild, and to retrain many of its people. Attached to Canal Street, the city's urban core is a one-block appendix, exchange place. For years, a kind of dead end for winos, vagrants, drifters, dead men. Each weekday morning, about 8.45, Jessie Mae Ford, a product of the slums, mother of three, and the children's sole support, approaches the door of an elegantly paneled building. It is called the Adult Education Center. It stands in stark contrast to its present surroundings. Once it was the site of a rundown barroom known as the Squirrel Cage, where the nuts meet. Here, a group of local businessmen, aided by a grant from the federal government, inspired by a small group of dedicated educators, have built a special kind of school. Its approach is both business-like and highly personal. Oh, Jessie Mae Ford is more or less typical of the kind of woman, both Negro and white, who are engaged in a tough and challenging 12-month secretarial course, hours 9 to 5. It is designed to move them from welfare and despair to job opportunity and placement, from self-consciousness to self-pride, to teach not only aptitudes, but in a sense to reshape their attitudes and renew their lives. The idea began as the dream of a Roman Catholic priest, Father Timothy Gibbons. The school opened in 1965 as an experimental program supported by a federal government grant. After two years, though, it became apparent that its permanent success depended on the kind of support which local businessmen now provide. Last year, the Adult Education Center dwindled and almost died. Today, it's remarkably alive. And so is Jessie Mae Ford, perhaps for the first time in her life. This is a typical day in the life of Jesse May Ford, filmed as it happens, the way it happens, at the school that would not die. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please remain standing for the final prayer. Let us bow our heads in a moment of silent prayer for world peace, domestic tranquility, and personal dignity. Amen. Every time I have to write to our customers requesting them to make a payment, I re recall my school days when I used to find it so difficult to write a letter to my folks requesting spending money. The teaching of shorthand and is a basic part of the Adult Education Center curriculum. Them ...to send the money as soon as possible, if they could spare it. If they could not, they made, they made me understand the reason why they could not do. The center sets high standards of performance, requires strict attendance rules, proper grooming and dress, and allows no shortcuts. The basic aim is simply to train students to meet the demands of higher salaried and responsible positions. 
42% of the last class qualified for Steno GS4, the highest level rating in federal civil service. Dear Mr. Brown, as you know, we filled your order for envelopes as soon as you requested it. As you requested, we shipped these envelopes to your Los Angeles office. Your payment for these envelopes were due on August the 15th. We have written you several letters requesting payment, but we have not yet received your check or a satisfactory reason why you have not paid it. All right, open your books to page 63. We're going to take a five-minute time on 36B. Session machines up for 50 space line. Typing speeds, with few exceptions, range from 40 to 65. Definitely employable levels. There is also intensive instruction in English, spelling, mathematics, even personal cosmetics. Because many are Negro, they know they often must be better in appearance just to get in the door. Eyes on copy, ready, copy. There is a strong personal rapport between the teachers and the students. The teachers do not coddle, but they obviously care. The atmosphere is clean, tidy, businesslike. For there is a shortage of good secretaries today, and they know that to be a good secretary requires both concentration and hard work. Yesterday's discussion about the gun laws was quite interesting. Apparently you've done quite a bit of reading and thinking of your own, your opinions about whether we ought to have these laws, these federal laws, are quite interesting. What do you think about Sammy Davis Jr., though? What do you think about Yes, I Can? Let's leave Ms. Newsweek Ms. Felice Lemoyne teaches to... reading and self-expression. Many of her questions? students had never read a book Thank before. You. Any this year, they will read 14 in this course, as well as at least one news magazine weekly, and they will discuss what they've read and even argue about it. Most students increase their reading speed and comprehension at least three times over. Monopolizer on the stage. Jesse, do you have any comments? Yes, uh, Sammy Davis Jr.'s childhood, he didn't, um, I can't say too much for that because he didn't really didn't have too much of a childhood. And um, he didn't have any friends whatsoever, even when he went into the service, he was a loner. He didn't have any friends, you know, that he could call friends or anybody he could write to except for his father and his grandmother and his friend. And I just don't see, you know, I think that's probably why he, you know, acts the way that he does on stage and, you know, sort of monopolize. I uh, agree with Jesse. Um, I think that children do need vegetables and, and things that she was saying in that. But I'd like to bring in the part about um, when she said something about him going into the service. He did find one friend, which was Sergeant Williams. He gave him a number of books to read, and uh, every time he got into a fight or something, he tried to explain to him and to show him that he could not gain anything by fighting with his fist in that. That if he was to read and um, help himself this way, that uh, he would gain a lot more and maybe make a lot more friends. Well, yesterday someone was saying that um, Sammy Davis probably exagger was exaggerating a bit, um, saying that he didn't know what Negroes were, or he didn't know he was different uh, from other people. And from my own experience, when I was coming up, I didn't know what white people were. I thought I had never seen any. My father and my brother, my sister, they are all their affair. And I just classified them all as being very fair, bright people. Um, I thought maybe white people would be like white, like a sheep. I didn't think I'd ever seen any before. Well, uh, where was it that you lived? Uh, you know, here in Louisiana, that sounds strange to uh, think of white people that way. <laughs> well, believe it or not, I was raised in Natchez, Mississippi. Well, I guess I believe that. <laughs> I think, like Elaine and Leona said, he turned to be a Jew, and he knew that the people were going to be against the Jew. He was a Negro and a Jew, so what worse luck could you have in this world? But he didn't let that stand his way. So he went on and he fought the battles, and no matter how hard it became, he always said to himself, yes, I can. And that's why I think this is a great title for the book, and that 
no matter, I, I think everyone should think, no matter how, how hard it may seem, and just like this course, no matter how hard it may seem and how hard it may be to grasp these things, I think that we should say, yes, I can, because to me, like in typing, I find it difficult to get it, but I say to myself sometimes, yes, I can, yes, I can, and pretty soon I think that I'll be like Sammy Davis Jr. I hope I'll be on top. Taped exercise 1C. The purpose of this tape is to give you practice in using the correct word combinations for was and were. These sentences use pronouns with the verb to be in the past tense. She was downtown last night. She was downtown last night. It was downtown last night. It was downtown last night. They were downtown last night. One of the most imaginative courses involves the teaching of business speech. It is a sensitive area. Many students have dialect problems. The language of the disadvantaged, though powerful and often eloquent, is not practical in the mainstream of business activity. The Adult Education Center literally teaches a second language using program tapes and standard language laboratory techniques. The director of the center and its major source of inspiration and innovation is a former public school teacher, Mrs. Alice Geoffrey. She is 43 years old, a grandmother, as well as the mother of seven children. She's been teaching for 15 years, and she's been awarded the American Freedom Foundation medal and plaque for, quote, teaching individual responsibility, personal liberty, and love of country. The center's success, she says, depends on treating people like people. A small cherubic doll upon her desk has four faces, reflecting moods ranging from sadness to gladness. It usually says, I am happy today. Under her supervision, her staff produced a book explaining their second language theory for the Negro. It has become a model for many teachers across the country attempting to affect the so-called dialect shift. Now, many of the people we teach uh, speak a non-standard kind of English that is simple, powerful, and often eloquent but sometimes it is not accepted in the places where they want to go. So we uh, use the approach of an educator called E.S. Newton who says, we accept you and your language. Use it with your friends, your family, and in your own environment. But if you want to participate in every area of American life, why not learn the language that is spoken there? And this is a, a very a valid approach because we do uh, change our clothes for different occasions, and so uh, we change our speech for different occasions. Mrs. Geoffrey, what about Jessie? Would you say she is typical of the kind of student you have here? Yes, Jessie is typical. She is the mother of several children whom she must support. She's worked at the most menial of tasks, but she's capable of doing much more. This is such a waste when a woman has talent to contribute to the community, not to develop it to the fullest potential. And this is what she's doing here. She, she does it with great diligence. She's very eager to learn. In fact, once you have taught here, it spoils you for any other situation because the women are so eager to learn. They don't urge you to get out of class. They want every minute to count. And this is a great personal and professional satisfaction because teachers like to teach people who want to learn. And Mrs. Joffrey, what lessons do you think can be applied to other programs? I think the idea of quality education should be kept in mind whenever we're training the unemployed and the underemployed. I think the training time should be more realistic. I don't go along with this idea of instant training. I think we should give people uh, skills that will last them a lifetime, not just this period of time when everyone is so concerned about the uh, unemployed. Uh, I think, too, that the business speech course that we offer should be incorporated into all programs uh, that are training people in jobs where speech could be an obstacle to employment. Because the business speech course, in addition to 
providing the students with a second language increases their poise and self-confidence and raises their self-image, which is so important to this kind of person. great pleasure for me to be here and to have the opportunity to visit with you. I'm not going to make a speech in the sense of, of uh, a formal speech, but I want to share Responsible with you businessmen realize there are more job openings than there are skilled personnel to fill them. Each week, a New Orleans civic or business leader talks to the class. This is Murray Fincher, president of the Chamber of Commerce. In this position as president of the Chamber of Commerce, I've had an opportunity to see the sides of life in New Orleans that I perhaps would not have seen in any other way. And the message that I'd like to bring to you this morning is that a great many people in New Orleans care about the success of this school. One of the things that we did just recently was to conduct a survey among all the members of the Chamber of Commerce to determine how many jobs that were available in New Orleans at this point in time. How many jobs are there available and what type of jobs are there? And we heard from more than 200 firms at the last count. And at that time, there were more than 4,000 jobs available in the New Orleans area of various types and various skills. In recognition of your significant contribution to the students of the Adult Education Center this morning, this certificate is presented to you for your certificate contribution. Thank well, you. thank you very much. The Board of Directors of the Adult Education Center have only enough funds to last this year. Board President James Coleman hopes to stimulate much broader participation. He believes if business takes the initiative with government help, his school can set a pattern for all sorts of practical training enterprises. He is mainly interested now in companies setting up scholarship funds to sustain his school. They are looking for opportunities to train people to bring on their payrolls. I know in our own corporation's point of view, well, we have allocated sums of money for the specific purpose of training people. Uh, and I think this offers a wonderful opportunity here to, uh, uh, to have a scholarship sponsor program. And I think many companies uh, uh, in the community are uh, perhaps not aware of this and overlooking a wonderful opportunity. We, well, I think we all agree that we have a very worthwhile institution here. Uh, to me, the end result is the product we produce. And it looks like from the success of the employment of these girls that we are producing a very acceptable product. And this is what uh, we can advertise and show to the community that the end product is an employable, efficient office worker, and uh, I can't see any reason why we won't obtain the full support of the business community in New Orleans. Mr. Richard's office. The end product of the Adult Education Center is exemplified by Myra Lynn LeCabe, married, mother of two children, and a graduate of the center. Yes, I believe so. Uh, could you come in at 2 o'clock today? Before she entered the school, Myra Lynn worked off and on at various odd jobs for menial wages. Yes. Today, because of the training she received through the Adult Education Center, she is the personal secretary for the local public relations director of the Humble Oil Company, one of the groups sponsoring scholarships. Bill Richards, her boss, says this about Myra Lynn's performance. My observation is that she made a very good adjustment to the new environment. Uh, I think everybody went out of his way to be kind to her, but Myron is the kind of person to whom it is easy to be gracious. Now she is simply a normal part of the operation, and nobody notices that she's any different uh, from anyone else. She has uh, certainly advanced since she's been here, uh, when I first came, she was a clerk typist in this office. Uh, subsequently, I have reorganized the office and recognizing her on a merit basis, uh, she has been promoted and uh, is now my personal secretary. 
Well, in my experience, I have found that I have used everything that I learned in this school. Mm -hmm. I've learned how to meet people, how to talk with people, how to answer the telephone, uh, how to be at ease in different situations. And I use all of this on the job, and I love this job, actually. And mm -hmm. I love working in public relations and with people. There is an attitude change, isn't there, on both white and Negro? Definitely. What is it? Uh, it's a sort of a motivation that you get from the teachers right from the first day. They give you this idea that you can learn anything that they can teach you, mm -hmm. and that you will learn, and uh, you want to. It's contagious. Mm -hmm. And the, the teachers transmit it to the students, and the students transmit it right back to the teachers and you go right on and, and practice and study and it's all uh, spontaneous. Myra Lynn LeCabe is a graduate of Xavier Prep, yet without the skills she learned at the center, she probably would be earning one-third of what she earns today. Of the 169 graduates, 161 are now working at major secretarial jobs, earning an average of 335% more than they ever did before. Not only have they learned how to earn, they have, in a sense, put on a new face. I think the foremost thought in my mind that helped me decide to, to decide to come to this school was the fact that I was suffering from a poverty. Mm -hmm. And uh, not the poverty that we've heard so much about here lately, but a poverty of self-image. Of self-image? Yes. Mm -hmm. And I was a person I felt without a face, just mm -hmm. walking in a crowd of people mm -hmm. with faces, and I wanted to be identified. Tricia Morris, age 28, divorced, mother of a six-year-old son and his sole support. Despite the fact she had one and a half years of college, until she entered the center, she made no more than $30 a week, and she was bitterly sensitized to the subtleties of job discrimination. That was given me, to me was the fact that I was a Negro, mm -hmm. and in place, the place that I, the position that I applied for, they uh, placed a ninth grade white girl, and the girl couldn't even make change, and uh, she couldn't spell, and uh, I found myself helping her to do these things, and then uh, all of a sudden it hit me, well, you know, why should I help her, and I was becoming a little bitter. Abigail Jerome is 37 years old, sole support of five children, a former resident of the St. Thomas Housing Project. Well, I guess in two very short words, I just have to say financial security. You didn't have that before. I had it to a degree, but I was on the welfare rolls, and uh, in supporting myself and five children, I kind of felt I'd probably never get off those welfare rolls. And if it hadn't been for this school and for the skills that I got here at this school, I never would have been able to get a job uh, that would give me enough income to get on my own. Mm -hmm. to get off the welfare rolls. And Not anymore. I don't, I don't think uh, we're identifying ourselves so much with uh, welfare anymore. I think we want to be contributing members of society. We want to feel that we're a part of society, and we know to feel this, we must accept certain responsibilities. And the only way we can accept these responsibilities is to be prepared for them. And this preparedness helps us to keep fright down, mm -hmm. to keep us from thinking that we'll be run out eventually. Keep fright down and hope up. And hope up very much so. It's just an eagerness to learn, I think, uh, and to see that your future will be better from what you get out of a program like this. Mm -hmm. it was, uh, and, they, they, and I think the teachers helped to do this. I, I, they were truly inspiring. Inspiring. It, they really inspired you to, to want to work, uh -huh. you know, even though, you, you know, you might get tired and feel, oh gosh, you know, I can't just can't go on anymore, can't handle the whole work and the children and, and all the responsibilities that one would have. But they just kind of kept us all going. And I just think that if this program would be duplicated a hundred times throughout the city so that there would be enough programs for all the underprivileged people, I think it's a shame that only, say, now only 60 girls are able to benefit from this program. Uh, I wish it were big enough to, to hold all the people and all the girls that, that could really use this kind of training. This program It's just too small. Mm -hmm. well, it should be and there's not enough of them. There's not enough of there's them. There's just not enough of them. The Negro has come to realize that uh, the rights are here and they're ours and we intend to take full advantage of them. But along with these rights and privileges, directly in, in ratio with these rights and privileges comes responsibilities. And I think we're preparing ourselves to better accept these responsibilities and to become better members of society, contri contributing members of society. Mm -hmm.
With this, I think, comes a certain pride, don't you, of achievement? A pride of achievement, a, a pride of self-esteem, and... Um, Perhaps that identity, or that self-image that, that you identity, lack. that self-image, I think uh, we've gained our face. I'll put it like that. Do you feel a new face, Patricia? Yes, I do. I feel that I can walk in a crowd now and be identified. I think that uh, I have uh, put on my makeup. And you know... As they say, I'm all dressed up and I'm ready to meet society. The greatest charity is to help someone to help himself. Doling out welfare funds is certainly not the solution. And sometimes it causes as many problems as it solves. Criticism of government in itself without constructive action is not a proper solution. A partnership between government and business jointly channeling funds into proper incentive projects is certainly a step in the right direction. Adult Education Center is an example of what can be accomplished by putting a right idea into practice. The idea that is motivating our group and in fact motivating this whole school is characterized by an old Chinese proverb. Give a man a fish and you feed him for a day. Teach him to fish and you feed him for life. And I might add that you not only supply his daily needs, but you show him how to enjoy life by supporting himself. This is Adult Education Center's function and its goal. Oh. 